Hello everyone and welcome to Sandbox CDB and Kernel Space Program 1.0.5. In this episode we have the uncrewed test launch of the Highly Functional Personal Space Shuttle or HFPSS. The HFPSS is a small science ship that has its own transfer stage that it docks to and as well as two boosters. Here you see the cockpit of the science ship. It has a thermometer, barometer and gravioli detector as well as a command seat in an open air format rather than an enclosed cockpit. This may be dangerous, which is why we are first testing the rest of the rocket uncrewed. You can see from that view that each of the two recoverable boosters has two thud engines at the bottom, and then the core transfer stage has a nerve nuclear engine, and then the tail of the, of the HFPSS has its own jet engine and eight ant engines. Here we have an excess ladder. Unfortunately, there is no way for the Kerbal to slip between the booster and the transfer stage, so it's uncertain what they were expecting to do with that. That will have to be fixed before a Kerbal is actually launched on this, as uh, currently there's no way for a Kerbal to get into the cockpit. Anyway, uh, here we go. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Four, three, two, one, and lift off. We have lift off of the HFPSS on its first test flight. The transfer stage will be left in orbit, but the small shuttle will be returning to the KSC. Roll program is complete. Alongside the nerve engine are four twitch engines that are used for vernier thrust because the nerve engine does not gimbal and so there has to be some sort of control authority. Because the nerve engine burn is so long to get the shuttle to orbit, the boosters are taking it at an extremely high pitch trajectory and there the nerve engine is lit at altitude. You'll note two locked tanks at the top of the transfer stage. Those actually contain the fuel for the shuttle. Currently the shuttle is unfueled except for 30 units of mark propellant. And that is so that the nerve engine does not have to work too hard to maintain balance. The shuttle's own engines are currently off. Okay, here we go, getting ready for booster separation. And again, you'll note the extremely high pitch being maintained for long nerve burn. There we go. Boosters have separated. The two boosters with two thuds each are now off. And now it's just a nerve engine and four twitch engines. Resources being displayed are stage only because eventually the oxidizer will run out and that means that the twitch engines will no longer be functioning. When that happens uh, it'll just be a nerve without any gimbling and the only control will be reaction wheel control. Again, there is still oxidizer in the vessel in the lock tanks at the top. There you see the current trajectory and obviously we still have quite a long ways to burn before reaching orbit. And here we are about to have twitch burnout. There we go. And now it is just the nerva and the reaction wheel. Nerva getting red hot there. Now we've called the nerve stage a transfer stage even though it's using most of its fuel to get into orbit because it can be refueled by that docking port at the top and in fact the refueler is simply the exact same stack without the shuttle and without the nerve engine and so only the twitch engines will be at the bottom of the stack and then RCS ports will be added to that, uh, that fuel tank and it would rendezvous with this nerve stage and then the nerve stage will be fully refueled to help transfer the shuttle to other planetary locations. The shuttle itself, once it is fueled, has more than 2,000 meters per second when it's not carrying its jet fuel. Here we go, we have a solid apoapsis and burning at apoapsis brings our periapsis to the requisite 100 kilometers. The shuttle will use its own ant engines to bring itself to a circular 100 by 100 orbit momentarily. But here we will have the separation of the shuttle from the transfer stage. And again, the shuttle can redock to the transfer stage when it is ready to go to a different planetary location. It will use its 2,000 meters per second of delta V to go within a particular system, such as the Joule system, for instance, or within the Kerbin system between the moon 
and Minmus. And there we go, finishing the refueling of the shuttle from the stores in the transfer stage. And now the shuttle will undock. It'll use its RCS ports to push itself away from the transfer stage. And now it is ready to go. The transfer stage is also ready to go. It has its own controller and of course solar panels to remain charged. It's got a battery. And certainly it's not just the shuttle that could use that transfer stage. If another vehicle wants to dock with it on the front docking port for instance, it could be used to boost something else. Okay, here the shuttle is making its retro burn to re-enter and it will set its periapsis to approximately 26 kilometers in the hope of hitting the KSC that way. However, we don't know the exact altitude that it should be aiming for given that this is the first test of this particular system. There we go, 26 kilometers. Now we're not particularly sure what would happen to a Kerbal during launch in the command seat, nor during re-entry as the Kerbal is fairly exposed. Here we see a shuttle at a high angle of attack, which could presumably keep the Kerbal safe, but will it really? We're just starting to get flame effects at approximately 51 kilometers altitude. There is an overheating warning in the nose section of the shuttle, and that looks to be the probe core in fact, which is a bit exposed there. Perhaps some redesign may be necessary to keep that safe, perhaps move it further to the back. But so far it's not reached critical levels. Interestingly, the landing gear, the docking port at the bottom of the shuttle all seem fine. The RCS ports are fine, the battery at the nose is fine. By the way, this shuttle is not designed to glide to a landing. It doesn't have much lift with those wings and the body itself does not provide much lift, being just small round tanks. And so it will have to use its jet engine in order to make a safe landing. Here we see it is through the re-entry. And now getting ready to turn on the jet engine, the LFO tanks or at least some of the LFO tanks are being shut off. Some of the LFO will be dumped to lighten the shuttle as it is a little bit heavy at this point. And of course the LFO will be dumped by using the ant engines on the tail which you see arrayed there. Initially this was designed as a perspective SSTO space plane, a single stage to orbit system. However it was found not to have the requisite performance with its uh, tiny jet unable to get to a speed where the ant engines could then push it to orbit. And so it became adapted into this system. And so far it's looking quite good, though again we do not know if this could keep a Kerbal safe or not. Indeed it's worth noting that the heaviest mass involved in this system is actually the nuclear engine. The nuclear engine may be heavier than the empty mass of the shuttle. Uh, details on that have not been released. Okay, gear is down. Approaching the runway. And there the ant engines have finished dumping the fuel that they were tasked to dump. Still carrying a fair load of liquid fuel and oxidizer. But this should make the shuttle light enough for it to land safely. Two hundred meters. Feet dry. One hundred meters. Fifty. Forty. Thirty. Twenty. 10 meters, just off the deck, and touchdown, touchdown of the tiny, highly functional personal space shuttle. And there we have it, the conclusion of the test flight. With the exception of the overheating in the probe core, uh, phenomenally successful. But the question remains, 
Will it be safe to place a Kerbal into that cockpit? Well, there may only be one way to find out. Uh, we hope you will tune in for that. For now, we'll say thank you for watching this presentation of Sandbox CDB. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And we'll see you next time.